Welcome friends to the Someone Gets Me podcast. I am your host, Diane Allen, and I am so delighted that you're here. This podcast was created because I believe there is a visionary leader inside each one of us who is waiting to be seen. In each episode of Someone Gets Me, you will hear useful tips from successful visionaries who will share their stories about how being seen has allowed them to take their vision out into the world with action. How to find talent in A-listers with Cord Kostler. We have a great guest today. Welcome to Someone Gets Me. We're going to talk about talent and vision and how gifted visionary people manage the world and find their own inner talent and find talent and connect. So no better person that I can think of than somebody who is a talent person to talk about this. How about that? So here you go. I want to introduce you to my new friend who lives not too far from me here in Florida, Cord Kostler. Welcome, Cord, to the show. Well, hi, Diane. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Yeah, and we are close to one another. I'm in southwest Florida, just south of you from what I understand. Yes, we're about yeah. two, two hours from each other, two and a yeah. half hours, and on the beautiful west coast of Florida, on the Gulf of Mexico, and enjoying this great weather we're having. And Absolutely. I really, I'm it's excited. beautiful. I'm excited that you're spending the time here with us today to talk about talent, vision, and that kind of thing, because I think sometimes, I, I think people's natural talent, sometimes they don't even see it as a talent, and I think sometimes people who have talent don't realize the value in their talent. True. And I think sometimes the word talent gets misunderstood in general. And so I have like all these kinds of curious things popping in my head. So what I would like to start with, if you could tell us a little bit about you, how did you get in this business, this industry? Like, have you always done talent or did you do other things? How did this start up? Because this isn't like the most common industry in the world. So how did, how'd you get started? Yeah. So it is a little bit of a specialized industry, I guess. And I, many years ago, I took a leap based on kind of what I enjoyed doing, uh, what my interests were. You know, when I was in college, I, you know, I studied different things and got a degree in sports management and knew I wanted to be involved in some set of some type of marketing promotion, something like that. It was an interest of mine. And growing up, I was a fan of music from the fifties and sixties and sports, uh, baseball, football, basketball. I love the history of the game. And in the early days of the internet, I was a, a web designer and I programmed computers when I was a kid and, all this stuff. So I had all kinds of interests and I thought, you know, I really want to do something that kind of encompasses my interest, you know, turn a hobby into a business. And that's essentially what I've done, you know, over 20 years ago. And it all started really celebrity direct entertainment came from making contacts with celebrities uh, of all types and really grew. I mean, when I was in college, I was self-publishing a magazine that did celebrity interviews. So I thought, hey, this is kind of cool. I'm learning how to make some good contacts and uh, kind of working on a writing style. And what I'm doing, in essence, is promoting them through the magazine. Right. You know, there'd be links to, you know, a postal address for fan mail or you know, website, how people could book them for a a show or performance or speaking engagement or whatever. I thought, wait a minute, I, I can make some money doing this. We could turn this into something real. And it just, it grew from there. I mean, it really was kind of one step at a time. But when I look back at what my interests were back then, Mm -hmm. it's, remains the same interest that I have today. So that's kind of cool. I've, I've had uh, a lot of fun. I met awesome people and get to work with great people all over the world. So it's really just, uh, it's grown, but it's, I mean, almost identical to how it was 22, 23 years ago. 
So that, that's kind of cool. And, that, yeah. and, you know, we, we made a leap right out of, right out of college. We said, Hey, let's move to Southwest Florida. I had contacts in the music business here with uh, the legendary 1950s, 60s era group, the platters. They lived here in town. And I thought, what better way to combine the entertainment business and really get that rolling, combining that with, you know, love of sunshine and baseball and we'll move to Southwest Florida to a spring training site and start an entertainment agency. So that's kind of how it worked. <laughs> you know what I love about this story is it's so true because it is spring training down there and it's beautiful. And it's, you're one of the first people on the show that, didn't have a story of everything was terrible. And then I finally got back to my vision and now I'm happier. It's like you started out with, okay, well, how can I let all these things that I love and passionate about like come together and create something beautiful. And, and so I'm sitting here just laughing because I think, Oh my God, this is like so perfect that it is possible to do that. It is possible to start with the vision and keep going forward and letting it take sure. its own thing. Now, Diane, I, I did neglect to leave out some of the things in the middle of those 22 years or so. Like what? What did you leave out? <laughs> well, there, there are a lot of difficult times building the company and actually making it something that was sustainable and that I could keep up with as it grew. You know, there are a lot of hard times in between there. But for me, I was always able to bring it back to, hey, I love doing this. So there's always inspiration to keep it, keep it going, make it bigger and better, do my job better. So yeah, you know, it always sounds great on the surface, but there are definitely a lot of hard times, you know, now going through the COVID virus stuff, you know, that takes me back to 2000 going, man, business is slow, but we got to keep working and working to help out venues all over the world, get entertainment that their audiences will love and keep working for the artists that we have, mm -hmm. you know, to get them out there to people. And that mm -hmm. time will come hopefully sooner than later, but it's definitely, you know, there are great times and they're really, really tough times. And right now we're in a tough time, of course, with right. the, uh, the entertainment business. So how do you, how do you handle tough times? Okay. So we've <laughs> had tough times along the way. Sure. Thank you for all that honesty. And so how do you handle them? What, what are some skills that you do? Because all, every, we all go through hard times. It's easy to look at somebody who's got a really cool thing going, live in their vision and go, oh, that was easy. But right. if, you, if you peel it back and you see the diligence and the work and the effort and the focus and the blood, sweat and tears, so to speak, that goes into it, then, then you start seeing the depth. So yeah. how have you handled some of these hard times along the way to land you where you are today? I think it's a matter of, telling yourself to wake up in the morning and accomplish a goal, even if it's something small, because when I think when things are hard, it's hard to stay motivated sometimes. And I know these last nine months, I've really dealt with that. And I spend time kind of self reflecting on, you know, holy cow, the phones aren't ringing off the hook right now for shows. Fortunately, this last month has been pretty busy and we're booking some great stuff out for 2021. But there were times there, it's, you get up in the morning, you know that no one's going to call. They're not going to answer their phones when I call them because they're, you know, wherever out in California and their offices are closed. You know, if you send out promotional emails, they're not going to be jumping up for joy to see who you're managing or who you're booking. So those were the days you're just like, wow, it's going to be tough today to make progress in, in the right direction. So I try to remind myself of that. Right. Not always successful, but that's kind of wh what people have to do and what I do because it, it can be discouraging. Right. Sometimes it's like we can have the most powerful vision to be on a roll and we still have to deal with the ups and downs. We, and Absolutely. That's just the way yeah. it is. So yeah. when, when you're um, out there in the world working with people who have talent, what do you look for in somebody that you might want to work with? 
what kind of qualities or characteristics that you you identify or you resonate with that say that's a really good match? I think the main thing is I personally look for someone that wants to do it bigger and better than they're currently doing it. I mean, I over the years I've been you know contacted by hundreds or thousands of of perform, performers, singers, musicians, whatever it is, and they're happy with where they're at. And, you know, not everyone's going to play to a sold out stadium. You know, they just won't. They, they may have the talent, but they don't have the, the machine behind them to make that happen. But a lot of people are happy with just doing what they're currently doing. Mm-hmm. And especially if it's someone younger or trying to break into the business and they're asking me for my help. I'm usually not interested unless they see something that myself and my company and my agents can offer them that'll get them to that kind of next level Mm -hmm. that they want to get to. A lot of times I'll, I'll be contacted by people. They say, Hey, we're doing this, this, and this, you know, do you want to help out with bookings? (laughs) And I, I look at the overall picture and I'm like, well, no, cause you're kind of happy with where you're at. You don't really need me at this point. I'm just going to be someone extra, you know, in, in it'll be more difficult for me to actually help that entertainer. And it'll be difficult, you know, for, for the two of us to come together for that big vision, if they don't have it, you know, if they're content, it, it'll be next to impossible for me to hold their hand and make them into something bigger and better. And that, that's the same with new artists and also with um, kind of what our bread and butter is with some of the nostalgia acts, as I call, you know, as I call them, we book a lot of acts from the sixties and seventies and eighties and even earlier than that. And, you know, these are all people that have had successful careers or did when their records were current. And so what I try to do is keep them, you know, in the public eye, they still have a fan base. Their music is still amazing. Um, They love interacting with fans but if they have a tour schedule that they don't really want to add anything to and they feel like the way their show is or what they're doing is as good as it's going to get, they probably don't need me. So a lot of the acts that I book regularly are acts that, Hey, they had success in the sixties or seventies. And, um, a lot of those middle years there may have been tough and now, there's a huge um, resurgence on the nostalgia market pre COVID anyway. And I know it'll come back, but audiences love those acts. So then my job becomes, Hey, let's, you know, if you were playing casinos around the United States last year, let's do it bigger and better. Let's, you know, let's do a 20 date European tour because those fans are clamoring to see live and in person. And then, that's what we do. So that's kind of what I look for personally in acts that I'm interested in working with or those acts that might be interested in working with us. So, so you have a creative genius for expansion and when you can feel that desire for expansion from whoever the talent is, then that synergy is something that helps drive the bus for you. It's what excites you. It's that, it's- yeah, it, it's definitely what keeps it um, exciting and fun and makes it bigger and better. I don't think I have a creative genius. I just, uh, I mean, I, I have acts that I've, I've worked with for 20 years. And, you know, I always think, gosh, we could do this little part a little better during the show. Or, hey, let's add this song to the set list. Make it new for, you know, the next uh, audience member that sees the show. I like, I, I like and believe that you have to keep growing no matter how um, solid of an act or a performer you are. There are always ways to improve on it and make it better for the next time. 
Right. And, and for me personally, that's what makes it fun. Sure. I, yeah, I love absolutely. being involved in that. Absolutely. That, and that's a form of creative genius in my world is that being able to say, let's add this, let's add this song. Let's do this little thing. Let's right. do this little thing over here. Cause you can see the vision of right. the potential or the possibility with that little tiny shift maybe, or maybe a big one that then adds energy to the project. Exactly. Because oftentimes it's easy to keep doing what you're doing the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're fairly successful and getting by and it's easy just to keep it the same. Right. It, it is. And that's with any job that's with any, you know, in any walk of life, it's, the easiest route is just to maintain what you're doing, but that doesn't lead to the most gratification in doing it or the most success down the road. And I've found that because I found myself in that situation and I'm like, wait a minute, I've done this the same way for three years and we haven't really grown and yeah, I'm a little bit bored. So mm -hmm. that's why I try to think of it as best I can with, that look to the future. Where are we going to be at a year from now? Right. You know, is the show going to be the same? Am I going to be the same? Is our company going to be the same? Every, now everything's been switched up a bit with COVID because yeah. a lot of us are going backwards a little bit because we're not out there with the people and venues aren't, aren't booking as much or in the same way. But it's kind of like even more so now those same elements are true because when we do come back, you know, I have shows on the books for uh, January. So I know we're going to be back and I'm pretty sure we're going to be back stronger than ever. So when we do that, do we want it the same as it was in February of 2020 or October of 2019? You know, do we want it? Is our business going to be run the same or the shows on the stage going to be the same? I think it would be the wrong choice to say yes to any of those. I totally agree with you because probably the thing I miss the most, because I'm an introvert and I uh, don't have to be out in the world too much. And when people get like weird and crazy out there, I just go sailing or something like I don't right. like the craziness. But the thing I miss more than anything in the world is my live entertainment. Sure. And not being able to go to the theater and to, like intimate concerts and things like that, where I just really can enjoy music has right. been a really big loss for me. And I think it's true for a lot of people. So I think that, you know, when we do get to finally get to hang back out in theaters again and listen to live music and go to the theater, there will be a resurgence because I, I'm not the only one feeling this way. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And entertainers too, you know, I work, <laughs> work a lot of people who are on stage and that's one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, a couple of them have done like um, concerts over Zoom and things like that, you know, electronic, right. but there's no audience. And so there's the, that energy exchange is void. And yeah, exactly. The, you know, the, the feedback, I, I think what drives, you know, most um, artists on any type of stage is feedback from the audience. So even in today's little world of virtual uh, concerts, you know, through Facebook or Zoom or whatever it is, you know, there's no immediate um, mm -hmm. feedback from the audience, you know, and that's what drives the performers on stage. So it's definitely a lot different. Yeah. Yep. So I can't wait. I'm glad to hear that you're booking things in January. That gives me hope. Yes. Yeah. And just in general, like hope, like please. Right. Right. So what do you do for fun? Um, for fun. Oh yeah, goodness. Like to, for your own enjoyment, your own personal enjoyment and fun. Like you have this really cool company and get to be around really amazing people and you get to be creative. And so it's also stressful. And oh yeah. So, and so what do you do for fun? What do you enjoy? I think most of my kind of times that I would consider relaxing times are probably, you know, at a, a softball field or a baseball field or whatever it might be. Um, I have a daughter that's a sophomore in high school, so she's still playing. Um, and I think that's some of the most relaxing times. Oh, hold on a second. I have a FedEx guy here. 
<laughs> and I have a puppy going crazy right now. And a dog going uh, crazy right now. Hold on one second. Okay. No worries. That's what the pause button and editors are for. <laughs> <laughs> I have so no yeah, problem. so for fun, I think we, we end up at a softball field oftentimes. And I have a my second oldest daughter. She coaches high school softball. Um, the youngest one is still playing at a high level. Um, we have two grandkids. That is a lot of fun when we're hanging out with them. Unfortunately, my two older kids, um, they all still live in town here, so they're close by. So I think that's usually what, what we do with fun, something related to the kids and hanging out here in town somewhere. Oh, that's fun, you know, and nice and relaxing and having good connections, you know. That's oh, yeah, that yeah. And, and, you know, and I have a couple hobbies that I still do on the side. I mean, it's kind of weird, but I um, collect, vintage computers and software and I don't have much time for that at least pre-COVID I didn't but I still enjoy it um and I'm still kind of into that and collect a lot of uh memorabilia from music and sports and so that's kind of fun stuff especially during a pandemic when there's not much else going on and you can't get out in the world much so yeah, yeah. That's fun. I think, I think there's great value and energy in history, like the history of the art or the history of the craft or the history right. of the fill in the blank. Right. Oh yeah. Um, and one of my other podcasts is called sailing legends and it's all about collecting the sailing stories from all of us that oh, are really? part of the history, you know, and, and, um, and having people tell the story and, I think there's a great value in that, in, in preserving history and preserving the story of the journey, whatever that right. would look like, you know? And so those, I think those are great things to do personally. You know, and, and along those lines, that, that's what's so fun about my job and what I do. I mean, I'm working with the acts that growing up I was a fan of. And nice. so I'd study the history of the group or the singer or, you know, whatever it is. And I get to work with them and kind of continue on that history a bit. So that's really fun for me. You know, it's, Hey, I work with the former members of the beach boys. So growing up a fan, mm -hmm. able to, you know, see where they fit in, in the history and they, you know, they played this big show or whatever. I'm like, wow. You know, I'm friends with these guys. These are the guys on stage, and we're able to bring that to current audiences. Um, you know, it's so all those groups that I grew up loving. I get to work with, and yeah, being kind of a, a student of the history makes it that much more relevant today. I think so. That's cool. I think I, it I think, love that aspect of it. Yeah, I think it makes it very relevant, and I also think it. I like I, as you're talking, I kind of see like the the appreciation of the history and, and the person, the people, how it started, the group, whatever oh, the yeah. scenario is. But then also your presence helps enhance the legacy that's emerging from that history. Sure. Yeah. And I yeah. find that to be so beautiful and and such great work. And so it's not just about calling and booking things. It's about honoring the journey and the right. value and the vision of the person and, oh, exactly. uh, and their idea. And that, right. that's much different than being like a booking secretary. <laughs> right. And, there, and there's, yeah, I mean, you're hundred percent right. And I think that's one thing that we kind of bring to it that is different. Mm -hmm. You know, if you call uh, a major agency somewhere to book, you know, let's say a, you know, a huge act that is uh, from the 90s or 2000s and they're touring the world, that agency that they're working with, you know, that you'll probably get on the other end of the phone. They may not even know the history of that act or even know that person personally. And, you know, I love road managing for our acts and I know our other agents that we have, they love going out on the road, you know, with the, with the groups and, you know, 
doing all the different elements from booking flights to hotel rooms to, uh, you know, ground transportation when, when we're in the city of the show to setting up a merchandise and meet and greet table for after the show and running that. So yeah, being involved is kind of something we do that's different than a lot of, a lot of agents out there that, and, and there's definitely a place for them because not everyone can be hands on all the time. And, but I, the aspect that I love most about what I do is that I choose to be hands on because I am a fan of the music and the artists that we work with. So yeah, it's kind of a neat element and it translates, you know, if I, if I have a client call me and they're not familiar with the history of the temptations, for instance, but they know I manage a former lead singer of the temptations and a temptations review his group. You know, if they don't know the history, I can convey that very accurately because I've studied the history of the temptations for, you know, over 30 years now. So I know it inside and out. And I know the product that we have is, you know, it's easy for me to, to sell them on that or at least show them why I love the act so much and then they can make their own choice. But yeah, I think that personal connection is important because at the end of the day, the person buying the ticket, going to a festival or a theater or a, a casino to see that act, they're there because they want to feel connected to it. Otherwise no one would go to a, a life that's sit at home and, and uh, listen to that act on the computer or TV show or video or vinyl in your collection and that'd be good enough. For most people though, that's not good enough. And those are the ones that we market to that want that personal connection with that act. So right. I, I love that part of my job. Oh, that's really cool. So what kinds of things do you do to um, decrease your stress level? Because it's a lot of stress, mm -hmm. even though it's a lot of fun. So what do you do for like taking care of, of stress? Um, I have not found the stress reducing solution. <laughs> um, I think sometimes I just, you know, try to clear my mind from it, whatever stressing me out, honestly, mm -hmm. and work on a, on something different for a bit mm -hmm. and then come back to it when my mind's a little calm down and then just knock it out. But I, I think the main things with, that stress me are essentially like if you envision a to-do list and you have too many things on there that you can't get done right away, so you can't check them off that list. I think that's the main thing that's stressful for me. Yeah. So what I do is maybe try to knock out a few uh, projects or something off that little to-do list and get rid of that. So then I can come back and focus on whatever element is stressing me out without other things hanging off to the side. That's, that's probably, yeah, that's probably the main thing I do. Oh, that's, that's great. And it's try to chip away at something else. And right. then come back to it. Yeah, it's very practical, and it's like just pay, take take it up, just start taking bites off of it, and it will help right. relieve help relieve it. So I have a couple other interesting questions popping in my mind, and they they might seem a little random. Uh, one of them is because you you mentioned that you tra you know you like to travel with people, and you've been all around, and you've known lots of people. I perused your website and saw all the amazing pictures of the different people, and. Um, and then I think about my own work with all the people I work with in the entertainment musical world. And, and my question is, um, what is the most memorable food you've ever eaten? Ooh, memorable food. Well, I've got to say, I like most all food. Um, <laughs> okay. Memorable. I mean, I, I've been able to sample different foods from a lot of different areas of the world. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of something that's really memorable. Hmm. And there's been so many, like I said, I'm in South America 
I love everything. And he each time, the first time in different regions, it's always new. So that's memorable. Um, Europe, in different parts of Europe, you know, they have their specialties that the first time you're actually there trying stuff out. Right. It's all brand new. So that's memorable. Um, most of what is like really memorable that I'm thinking about right now uh-huh. were things that I chose not to eat. <laughs> because I, knew I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but overall, um, I just, I love trying new foods. If it's not something so disgusting that I'm pretty sure I couldn't stomach it. I eat it and usually enjoy it. I mean, there, there, and there's been some, you know, there are some strange foods that we consider strange anyway, that are pretty common in other areas uh, of the world. Right. And so I, I always try to dive into some of the local fare, so to speak. Right. And so that's kind of the explorer in you. Like I'll, I'll go so far and I only want to try all the new stuff. And then I also have some boundaries on this. Like, I don't know, that might be a little more. Right. So yep. and that makes total sense. I am. Um, and it's funny because I ask a lot of people that question who, who have traveled a lot, you know, like all over. And I've heard everything from sweet tea in Georgia to sushi to steak, <laughs> like right. and then yak butter. Like it's been all of these different answers and we don't realize sometimes what sticks in our memory, like what, right. what um, impacts us when we, as we cruise along. So I, I love asking everybody who's traveled a lot, like what sticks out when you think of memorable, you know? Yeah. Or, I mean, or, and, and as I was like answering that question, I'm thinking of things. I'm like, that's not very interesting, but to me, it's memorable. I mean, one time backstage at a theater in Germany, there was some kind of like pumpkin soup. And so on the surface, you're like, that sounds really kind of boring and not very memorable. But that was actually, honestly, the first thing that popped into my mind was this soup. It's like a pumpkin cream soup of some sort. And it was absolutely amazing. I've never had anything like it. Unfortunately, we put in a request for the chefs to keep catering that. So we had it for the rest of the tour. And I don't even know what it's called. I need to call my guys in Germany and actually find out what it is. But that's that's something really weird that is memorable. And I haven't had a sense. And mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I didn't even tell you what it's called. And you and you just reminded me of one of my memorable foods when I went to um, Washington DC for my birthday, which is right around Thanksgiving. And I had gone, and in fact, it was on Thanksgiving that particular year. And I went to this restaurant in Georgetown, can't remember the name of it. And they had this butternut squash and quail, I think soup. And it was oh, like a yeah. soup and it was the best tasting soup I have ever eaten in my lifetime. Right. And I still remember like it was yesterday and we're talking, this was many years ago when you just brought up the pumpkin soup. I'm like, yes, I understand. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it just hits you in a way <laughs> where it's like, whoa, that's really amazing. You know? Right. And so the experiences that are collateral to all the things also add value and depth. To oh yeah, our, to our world. So, what do you see for the future of celebrity direct entertainment and you, the person, moving into 2021? I guess you're seeing some um, more opening up of live venues and people kind of moving around a little bit more. And, right. Um, what do you What do you see? Like when you look with your visionary self forward, what kinds of things do you see? Yeah, so I think, um, I guess a quick summary would be I'm hopeful the vaccines that are, you know, being distributed are going to be effective and people are going to have the opportunity to get out and go to live performances, you know, whether it's Broadway or, you know, uh, musicals or theater or musical performances people will get back out and they'll have missed it for over a year and it's going to come back bigger and better. That's what I see for the future. So for us, 2021 is going to be probably our busiest year yet. So this would be a a way we could say it's, we hope you've rested up during all these months because exactly. you're about to hit the road running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. It's like so exciting. So who's your favorite baseball team? Um, Being that you love baseball. 
honestly, and I, I'm asked this all the time, I don't really have a real favorite these days. Um, I kind of follow everyone growing up in the Midwest. I, I grew up in Nebraska. So the closest major league team to us were the Kansas, uh, Kansas city Royals. Right. So, and their triple A team was in Omaha, Nebraska. So I grew up loving them and I grew up a fan of the New York, New York Mets. So, mm-hmm. um, I was who my favorite player as a kid played for, but now like, and I've worked in, professional baseball as an umpire and a couple different things. So I don't really have a real favorite. I mean, here in Southwest Florida, of course I follow the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, and I've worked with that organization and, you know, other teams that have spring training sites in Southwest Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm just kind of a fan of the game in general. There's really no one that I am a diehard fan of more than others. Nice. Yes. I love the game of baseball and I, I love it live more than I love it. Like when I'm watching it on TV sure. or whatever. Yeah. And um, I had a friend of mine, this is an aside, but you'll dig it because she was a Mets fan, huge Mets fan. And, um, and she just was just, just crazy New Jersey, just wild personality. And we went to a Rays game shortly after they came they were starting like it was okay they were still new kind of and they had this guy doing this trivia thing in a booth you know like see if you could beat this trivia dude right and i said oh kathleen's her name i said you're gonna you you could walk all over this guy and like, spit him out sideways and she says probably so i said come on let's do it let's do it and she like totally doesn't didn't look the part and she trumped him on every card and then she started asking him questions he couldn't answer oh that's funny because yeah. she was really into the history of the game and all of them and we were sitting there and she goes that's cal ripkin and he's in his streak and this and that and this person was born in 1957 and they did this 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 like with every person on the field yeah on both teams and See, I, like, I, I love going, I loved going to sporting events with her and, and she did the same thing with hockey because not only did I learn the appreciation more so of the game and a strategy, right. but also to see and experience that deep love of the history and where they came from the people. It's not just, not just the game. There's all the energy behind the game. Yeah, exactly. And that, Hey, and that's what I love about sports in general is, the history and some of the smaller elements that your average person doesn't know about. Right. I mean, I've, I've studied especially baseball history since I was a little kid. So, you know, I would read books and, you know, uh, players, um, autobiographies that, you know, came out in the sixties and seventies. I just, I'd go to the library and check out these books and read them. And these names would come up, you know, teammates that they had and, they did something cool in a world series or something that I never heard of. So then I go look up that player and, you know, even, even people that just had a, a little cup of coffee in the game and aren't well-known names. I love that little aspect of it and finding out about that portion of the history of the game. And, and actually that carries over to what I do in the entertainment business. I love the history of it and learning about, the people that have made entertainment grow and go over the years, you know, and and the average person doesn't know a lot of individual group members of different groups or, or things like that. But I love that part of, of music history as well. So I, I have a lot of fun with that. Yeah, it's that's to me. That's where the depth is in in the history and the and the people and like you said, the the not well known parts of it all. Like right. you don't really realize this or that or don't know that person or you hear that name and then you start digging in there and there's another really amazing thing um, that you didn't know if you're only exactly. paying attention to the surface. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So, was there anything that you wanted to share about on this show that I didn't ask you about yet? Um, no, not really. I don't think so. Um, gosh, I, I thought we had a good conversation. Oh, we have more going. I just wanted to make sure I have one. <laughs> I, have a, I have two more questions. Actually. One of them is, um, have you ever had to fire an, um, an entertainer or a person that you were working with because they were just like incorrigible or rude or whatever. And you're like, I'm not dealing with them. Like, you know, 
you hear like bridezillas, but have you ever had entertainerzillas <laughs> um, <laughs> that you've had to fire? Yeah, yeah like, yeah. Um, one of the things that's really important to me is that, you know, the act that I'm working with, um, one is at least halfway easy to work with mm. or at least reasonable and, and, you know, remembers why fans are there watching their show and, you know, who ultimately is paying their salary or their fee for that performance. So all the acts that I can have in house with celebrity direct or acts that I'm friends with, I know they're good people. They're very talented and they love their audiences. And, you know, if all those elements are there, then you can kind of work through other stuff because problems always come up with a booking or might even be day of show. Something's not right with the sound company or whatever it might be. But if you keep those basic elements in mind that, and, and you remember, you know, kind of who's paying your salary and why you're there. Um, then the other things can be worked out. So right. yeah, I, I have had um, bookings that I've done. And after we left, the concert, I, you know, I've told myself I will never work with that person again or that act again mm. because it was just, in the end, it wasn't worth my little commission. Wasn't fun for me. Wasn't fun for the audience. My client at that theater or the festival wasn't fun for them. So I don't really care who you are or were, you know, <laughs> with what I do, it, it has to be at least fun for me to be involved in to continue working with you and the audience needs to at least be treated with respect that they're the one buying a ticket and that trickles down to the performer. So I've had a few that don't remember that. And, you know, I've always said it's easier to cross someone off your list than it is to build a list of everyone that you ever would work with it's easier to maintain that little shorter list of people, you know, not to ever call again. So yeah, yeah that's, that's <laughs> happened a few times. Yeah. I was wondering, I was wondering about that because, you know, when you're talking about a lister type people or people that have, have had a lot of fame, there's a lot of, you know, veil around it and all that kind of energy. Sure. And sometimes that can go sideways and, oh, yeah. and then other people get drawn in or not or whatever. And so I'm like, I wonder if he's ever fired him. Like I have fired clients that, right. um, it just was not a win, win, win any longer for whatever reason. Exactly. And, yep. and why, you know, keep going after something or working on something that's right. no fun for anybody. And, yep. um, and I was wondering if you had that same experience. Oh yeah. And, hey, and then there's, there's been times where there's a new performer that I've never worked with before. Mm -hmm. And I've heard horror stories about them and how awful it was going to be. And, you know, that I shouldn't book them or they were just, you know, them and their entourage and management and musicians and everyone else is just terrible to work with. I've heard those stories and show up and it's absolutely wonderful. And I have a blast and build lifelong relationships and continue working with them. So you never know what you hear. You know, you never know if it's exactly true. So I've, I've had those uh, experiences also. Yeah, so that's where your open-mindedness and paying right. attention has paid off. That's that visionary yep. part again. It's like, if I'm open, you know, like I've worked with some people where I was warned, oh, don't get involved in that. Don't do that. Right. And actually those a couple of them are like two of my, my favorite people to work with. I have a completely right. different experience than what I was told I would have. And so I'm glad I said, well, let's just let me see. Let me just exactly. put my foot in the water and I can back out if I want to, but I just want to see. And right. I'm really glad that I let that part of me show up because it ended up being, and still is really great. Yeah. And, and sometimes in those uh, situations, they, you know, entertainers are always bombarded from every direction, whether it's fans or, you know, they, they do have to answer to a lot of people. So that adds more stress than, yeah. you know, I have to deal with the people on the stage have so much more to do than I have to, you know, it's different, but Hey, they're, you know, 
they are the reason that we're there ultimately. Right. But there, there are times that I think they're used to being treated a certain way. And I've, I've had performers that I've never worked with before and we show them for the first time and eventually get to be friends with them. And, you know, and they may have that negative reputation or something. And they say, listen, we, you know, don't always get treated in the best way. You know, there's demands on us to do things and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they, you know, when the dust settles, they're like, Court, you handled yourself differently than most. And that's why we're hitting it off so good. So mm-hmm. sometimes I like to think, hey, maybe if I do things a little bit different, um, it'll make those situations that much easier on everyone. Because I try to be a good liaison between the venue that is booking the, the performer and the performer. I want things to go smooth for the, the talent. And I want things to go smooth for my client that's the venue. So if I work to make both sides happy, it's usually a lot better for everyone. And I think there are, there are some that don't do that. They only work on behalf of one side or the other. And I look at it, hey, you know, I'm, I'm the agency in the middle between a venue and, and the, the performer. And all three of us then, our ultimate goal is to make sure that the audience, the, the fourth person who's actually paying all of us to be there, if it goes smooth for that fourth element, the audience, um, then the menu is going to be happy. They're going to call me again. And then I can call that act again. So I think sometimes if you're just a, a realist and keep that in mind while you're there, mm-hmm. it makes things go better overall. So some of the, you know, some of the personalities that we all hear about on the news, you know, as being gruff with, people or their fans or a venue uh, owner or management or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we got to remember they're humans also. And sometimes that makes a big difference. Right. And like you said, there's a level of stress that a lot of people don't understand. Right. And, and it's true. There is a level of stress. A lot of people don't understand. And it's not that you have to understand the level of stress. It's let's have a little bit of compassion and understanding and work together so that everyone wins. The audience exactly. gets what they came for. The right. performer gets fed in a cool, spiritual, neat way and gets to, to enjoy their craft in, a, in an amazing way. Right. You get to bring the people together. You're like the great connector. I see the little great connector. And then the venue right. gets the benefit of everybody going, how great that show was at that venue. So exactly. That's, that's what it's about. When everybody walks away smiling, then that's magical and that's a win, I think. Right. And I think that's the same for life. I think it's the same for all relationships. You know, when we're connecting different people or we're connecting ourselves with others or we're just connecting in general to pay attention to all the facets of all the people. And that's why I think your love for history sets you apart in some ways because you understand right. that, that deeper part. And, and that's why I'm so glad to have you on the show because there's, there's depth and there's, it's a difference than the same old typical thing that, that we hear about. So I really appreciate sure. your time on the show. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. And um, then I will thank you for your time because i you have been so generous today. Thank you so much. What is, let me see, if there was going to be a billboard that we were going to put up in, and the whole world was going to see this billboard with your quote, Cord Costler's quote, what would it say? What's your message to the world in a billboard fashion? Oh, goodness. A, a billboard. Um, so it kind of sounds like one of those here lies things on a tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what? I, I, I've never thought about that. So I wouldn't know how it'd be written out exactly on okay. said billboard. Uh-huh. Um, I would just, I, I would want people to see or read or at least to think about me that um, I work hard um, 
and I'm passionate uh, passionate about um, my family, my work, and hopefully I've brightened someone's day and all those interactions sometime along the line. Uh, that's uh, when it's all said and done, that's what you want people to remember you by is that, Hey, because of some little thing that cord Costler did, they were able to have some kind of experience or some kind of cool memory. So I think that's, that's the main thing. So I translated it for you. Work hard, have passion for family and your work and brighten someone's day. Hey, that's very well written. I love that. Yes. Right? That's what you <laughs> That's good. That would fit on a building yeah. perfectly. That's yeah, perfect. that would. Ask, if you will, with your name on it. And, I, and yeah. those are great principles to live by. That's perfect. You know? So I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to be on Someone Gets Me and to share your wisdom and, and inspiration and hope for people because I think sometimes, you know, it's easy to get bogged down and, and your optimism and the way you you think about things has. Such oh, thank you so much, Diane. So if you really love everything that Cord's been saying, like I do check out the show notes. Cause I have links to his things. You can see the different people he works with and you can follow him and you can return yourself to some cool venues for live entertainment soon. Absolutely. Sooner than later. So thank you Cord for being on the show. And remember, everybody, to keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star and you're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and live your purpose. Have passion. Bring sunshine and love to everybody. And until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well. Thank you for listening. I trust you gained some valuable inspiration and information. Please join me and other visionaries in the Someone Gets Me Facebook group. Or for more information on my services and additional episodes, visit someonegetsme.com. Again, thanks for listening.